So the next speaker is Christoph Herrmann, together with Anna Wilsch. And uh, Christoph uh, is at the Karl von Ossetsky Univers Universität in Oldenburg. And he will speak about transcranial current stimulation with speech envelopes enhanced intelligibility. Yes, uh, thank you for the invite and for the introduction. I would like to talk about something uh, that you may or may not know, transcranial current stimulation. And it gives a new view onto brain oscillations because it is able to modulate brain oscillations. And by modulating the brain oscillation, you actually can show that there is a causal relationship between the brain oscillation and a cognitive function. Because you modulate the brain oscillation and you look whether in turn some cognitive process changes. So that's what I would like to do with you today. Um, in the beginning, I would like to talk about the mechanism for those of you who don't know the mechanism yet. Then I will show you the physiological effects, what parameters of brain oscillations you can modulate. And then at the end, I would like to show you that we can modulate auditory perception and for you probably most interesting, um, also speech intelligibility. So what does that look like at first? You have to place at least two electrodes on the scalp of a subject, two or more, as you can see on this little styrofoam head. Um, and then you can either apply TDCS or I'll explain all these different versions of the stimulator. The one that you see on the left is battery operated and portable. Um, and there is another one, or there are different brands of course, but there are different types uh, that are less portable and only to be used in the lab, but then they're more versatile and have more channels and you can be more spatially specific with the stimulation. Um, when you think about the type of simulation and the waveform that you can simulate, what has been around for the longest is TDCS, where you apply a direct current. So you switch on the current and then the current stays on for some 10 or 20 minutes and you, then you switch it off again. This is not what I'll talk about. And then what's more interesting because it um, interferes with brain oscillations is alternating current stimulation. I will talk about that, where you switch on an alternating current of say 10 hertz to interfere with the alpha uh, for again some 10 or 20 minutes. But in principle, uh, any waveform that you can generate in MATLAB can be input into the stimulator um, and then it's actually um, being stimulated on the head. So you could, you could take impulses, you could record the EEG of someone and play it to someone else, or as I will show, you could use the envelope of speech to use that as an electric stimulation. And just to be uh, complete, there's also something that's called transcranial random noise stimulation, where you take band-limited wide noise and use that as the stimulation signal. One of the questions... <laughs> Good morning. One of the questions that many people ask is, well, you're applying a very low current, like a milliamp, to the scalp. And the scalp is very well con uh, conducting. And then there's the skull, which does not conduct very well. So the question is, how much of the current does actually go through the skull, into the head, penetrates the tissue, and can, in principle, interact with neurons? And for that, you can do simulations with finite element models. And we did that together with a mathem mathematician from Münster, Carsten Wolters, who has a very fine-grained model of the brain with uh, more than 2 million voxels. And every voxel is a tensor of conductivity, so it has a direction. Um, and um, many different parts of tissue. So for example, the bone uh, has two subcomponents, the solid bone and the sponges bone, because they have different conductivities and we were able to show that that's really important and influences the uh, predictions. And then you can place your electrodes. Here we have two rather big electrodes of 35 square centimeters. Um, and then you can look where in the brain we switched off the skin here because of course, yes, there is much more um, current density inside the skin. But if you uh, choose a different uh, uh, range and then switch that off and only look inside the brain, you see, yes, also inside the brain you have current density that is due to this electrical stimulation and it has some spatial specificity, so beneath and between the electrodes there is more current density than further away from the electrodes and it's on the order of 0.1 amp per meter at the max. Remember that because 
that will be important on one of the subsequent slides. And if you use more smaller electrodes, you can be much more spatially specific with your simulation, as shown here, for example, where we have two four by one montages over the two hemispheres, and you can see this is almost the spatial specificity that you can reach with TMS, for example. Another interesting question um, is, if you have this low intensity on the skin, does that actually do anything to the firing of neurons? Because that has been called in question, for example, by Bujaki. Now, um, the animal experiments that actually look whether a uh, voltage applied to the cortex changes neural firing or not is usually given in volts per meter, a voltage gradient, and where the uh, TACS intensity is given in milliamps. So we have to get there in a few steps. The first step was what I showed you on the previous slide, where we used the finite element model to see that one milliamp of TACS of course, has a range of uh, current densities inside the brain, but in the target region, it's about 0.1 amp per square meter. Then you need to know the um, tissue resistivity, which is given in ohmmeters, and which is also being argued about, but it's on the order of 3 ohmmeters, and then this converts into 0.3 um, volts per meter. And Bujaki compares that to a study where he's a co-author, which showed that you need one volt per meter to interfere with neurons, but there are a number of other studies, for example these, that show that also much lower um, voltage gradients interfere with neurons. They do not make a silent neuron fire, but if the neurons are firing because they get input from other neurons, then the spike timing and the spike rate can be modulated by TACS. And you see that the one milliamp is in the ballpark of intensities required for that. So we believe, yes, it does work. And yesterday already, um, Jonas said something about entrainment, and he already said that uh, I might go into this concept into more detail because we believe that if you use TACS in order to interfere with the brain oscillation, what's being at work is entrainment, and if I have time, I'll come back to that later. Um, I would like to guide you through the left figure at first. On the horizontal axis, I always have the driving frequency, so in this case, the TACS frequency. And here I have the response frequency, so in this case, the EG frequency. If you leave the system alone, you just see it at its eigenfrequency, so for example, the alpha frequency if you have a human subject at rest. If you drive the subject very strongly, then you only see the driving frequency, no matter whether you flicker or use RTMS or TACS. These are both not conclusive about entrainment or not. Interesting is if you have some intermediate driving force, because then the brain switches betw between two different regimes. One regime is it shows its eigenfrequency. But if the stimulation frequency is in the vicinity of the eigenfrequency, then the system will follow the driving frequency. That is the synchronization regime. And now you can put this into another diagram, which um, Jonas showed yesterday. Here you have the driving frequency and the intensity. And what you see here is that if you have a very low intensity, then you need to be very close to the eigenfrequency in order to modulate the system. But if you have a very strong intensity, then the uh, a region where you can actually drive uh, the brain or the oscillator becomes much wider. But interestingly, this goes down uh, uh, basically to zero. But then, of course, it's a very narrow range where you can do something. And Flavio Fröhlich did a very nice study where they recorded um, activity in rat cortex, at first without the sinusoidal electric stimulation, that's shown in black, and here you see bursts of neural activity and interburst intervals, and then he applied <laughs> electric sine waves to the cortex at different frequencies. Let's start in the middle. Here, the sine wave frequency is roughly that of the interburst frequency up here, but you still see an effect because the spiking becomes more regular. The neurons uh, spike during the troughs of the oscillation, but hardly ever during the, uh, sorry, during the peaks, but hardly ever during the troughs of the oscillation. And then he can slow down the interburst frequency or speed up the interburst frequency by changing the frequency of the sine wave that he is applying. So this is one evidence for um, entrainment being at work. Now we wanted to show that when we apply TACS to the human brain, we can actually interfere with brain oscillations and 
um, we will look at the online effect, so that is what is happening during simulation, and at the offline effect, that's what's happening after simulation. And here we recorded EEG during the TACS session, which is possible in principle, but you have a huge artifact. You see this huge sine wave, which is order in, on the order of uh, volts as compared to the microvolts that you want to see. But if you can assure that your EEG amplifier is not clipping, you in principle can get rid of the artifact by subtracting it. And what we did in addition is we had a visual task where an LED would change the color um, and that should in principle induce an ERP so we can see whether after artifact reduction um, or removal we can actually see this ERP or not. And the artifact reduction went in two steps. The first thing is that you try to compute a template of the sine wave, which is of course not a sine wave, but a rectified sine wave, and that works okay-ish. You see the magnitude um, of the artifact goes down, but in some trials there's quite a residual artifact. And therefore, in a second step, we computed a PCA and subtracted as many PCAs as were necessary because we know a couple of things. If this is the electrode montage, this is the topography of the artifact. And since we uh, stimulate at 10 hertz, this is the spectrum of the artifact. So we could look whether the PCA component looked like these two uh, things, and we could look whether after artifact subtraction, the ERP would look like the ERP that we would expect. And then, of course, that's individually different how many PCAs we have to subtract, but um, as you will see from the ERPs, these are the ERPs of a group of subjects that did not get stimulated. So this is uh, the ground truth for us, and you see the morphology and the topography of the um, ERPs to the standards and targets. And these are the data from the subjects that were stimulated with TACS at 10 hertz after subtracting out the artifact and computing the ERPs. And I hope you're convinced that they're not the same, they're different subjects, but you see the difference in P3, you see the morphology, you see the topography, it's very much alike. And this is, of course, not what we were after. We wanted to see, well, what is happening during simulation? On the left, you see what, what is happening for the uh, sham group. There are no significant differences. But here you, you see two interesting things. One thing is that you elevate the amplitude of the alpha during simulation. That's the gray spectrum. But in addition, you make it more narrow. So we think that is, again, evidence for entrainment. We think that subjects who had their um, individual alpha at 9 hertz were speeded up to 10 hertz, and subjects who had a faster alpha were slowed down to 10 hertz. And in addition, you see already the after effect, the green spectrum was recorded during the three minutes after the end of simulation, so you see that the elevated alpha amplitude remains there after the end of simulation. And now we also can look at the time course during simulation, so on the left side we see the sham group again, and since when the simulation is um, or the, the, the task is being switched on, it's a visual stimulation, you see the alpha go down, but then it's a rather boring task, the alpha increases over time. And in the simulation group, the alpha immediately goes up because of the TACS, and then it remains elevated also after the end of stimulation. And that was only... Um, then we looked at the after effect in a different study, um, where we uh, wanted to see... Actually, I think I'll skip that because I already showed also the after effect uh, for the uh, sake of time. You see already here that there is an after effect after the end of simulation, and then um, it's more certain that I can actually show my slides at the end. But another question was, well, how long does this after effect um, remain stable? And at first we only looked at three minutes, then we extended the after um, the interval after the end of simulation to 30 minutes, and we expected that we would see it decay over time, which didn't happen. Then we extended it to 90 minutes, and we expected that we see it decay over time. You have a question? How long was the simulation? The simulation was 20 minutes in that case. Um, and here you see how the amplitude of the alpha peak behaved over time after the end of simulation. And you can see um, it does not decay back to zero, but instead what happens is that the alpha in the sham group raises over time. So after some time, it, the difference between the two is no longer significant, and that was after 78 minutes or so. So 
on average for a 20 minute TACS simulation at the individual alpha frequency, not 10 hertz, um, you get a 70 minute after effect of elevated alpha amplitude. Um, once we knew that, we of course wanted to show that this is any good for some cognitive function. And we did a couple of other studies uh, in the visual system, which I will not show here because we're talking about the auditory system and about language. Um, and what we did here is that we applied um, TACS exactly at 10 hertz, and then we had an auditory task where we had white noise, and embedded in the white noise, we had brief impulses of sine waves that were supposed to be detected. And these sine waves were presented at different signal-to-noise ratios. I mean, here you can clearly see it, and here you can clearly hear it, <clears throat> but some of them um, had such a bad signal-to-noise ratio that they were not detected by the subjects. And uh, they were placed always relative to the TACS wave in different phases of the TACS oscillation. And what we then did is we computed the sigmoid function um, for the different intensities or signal-to-noise ratios and um, for the detection rate of these sounds. And here's a, a single subject, and you can see already what's nice. Um, in relation to the red sigmoid function, which was without TDCS, you could, uh, sorry, yeah, we call it alpha TDCS back then. Today I would call it uh, TACS, basically. You see that um, the different phases can both make it worse and make it better, the perception. And that was already nice to see. And if we look at um, all of the subjects, here you see the alpha wave again. And here we sorted the subjects because every uh, subject had the best performance at a different um, um, phase. We sorted them, but then you see all the uh, single subjects and the mean performance and a sine wave that we fitted there. We couldn't use an ANOVA because, of course, um, the average of a sine wave is zero, and therefore what we tried to do is we tried to fit a sine wave into the data, which is shown here. So you see each single subject uh, in blue, and then you see uh, the mean fit in red. And uh, here I took out two of the subjects so that you see that the sine waves that we fitted, which are shown in black, um, resemble the data points which are shown in red pretty nicely. So we think, yes, we are able to modulate auditory perception if we apply a sine wave to the auditory cortex. And uh, the reviewers are usually not so happy with um, nonlinear regressions of sine waves, and therefore we also had to do a t-test of the um, best phase versus the worst phase, and you can see that is highly significant, which made us happy, of course. Um, <clears throat> and then, I have to um, tell you a little anecdote. In Germany, the supervisor of your PhD thesis is called your doctor father. And in Germany, you have to do a second PhD thesis, which is called the habilitation. And there I actually happen to have an academic mother, Angela, who is no longer here today, is my habilitation mother. And as a good boy, of course, you're trying to impress your mother. So when I was able to do something with TACS, I went back home to the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig and gave a talk about what I showed you so far. And I was so happy and I thought I would impress her uh, with the things that I had done. And she said, well, Christoph, that is all very nice. You can modulate a brain oscillation. That's cool. And you can modulate auditor perception. That's OK. But why don't you try and modulate an important cognitive function. <laughs> okay, an important cognitive function. If Angela says so, she must be referring to something like speech or language, right? Okay, we, we tried that. It kept me busy a couple of nights. What can you actually do um, to impress your mother? Um, and to improve speech by TACS. And as we all know, um, if you listen to uh, language, you can see uh, the envelope and neurons entrained to the envelope. And interestingly, if you know the envelope of the speech signal, you can see that in EEG and MEG. And more interestingly, if you start to compress the speech and uh, present it in a faster way, then at first the frequency 
of the envelope just increases, and you still see that in the MEG. So here you can see that below 10 hertz, uh, you can see a resemblance of the um, speech envelope in the MEG signal, but at some frequency, which again differs from subject to subject, two things happen. The brain cannot follow the speech envelope anymore, and the intelligibility of the speech breaks down. So the idea is that the uh, envelope and the envelope being visible in the EEG is important for speech intelligibility. And then we thought, okay, since we can not only stimulate with sine waves, we try to use the envelope. We had a bunch of sentences, as I'll show in a minute. We extracted the envelope and then tried to stimulate that electrically at the same time as we presented the auditory sentences. As I'll show you here. So at first we um, measured the thresholds of the subjects because they shouldn't um, know whether they're being stimulated. So if you um, apply an alternating current to the skin, um, and if the intensity is too high, it feels a little bit like a tickling sensation. I don't know who of you checked your toy batteries when you were kids with the tongue, the nine volt batteries. Um, if they were full, that was quite unpleasant. If they were empty, you would f still feel that. And this is what TACS feels like if it's too intense. So we stay below that threshold. And also, if you apply it over the back of the head, you can uh, um, induce phosphenes. Then we uh, determined the hearing threshold. And then we presented sentences that you will see on the next slide um, and did nine lists of this during TACS. And that works as follows. So um, for the two auditory cortices, we will have current flow from T3 to CZ and T4 to CZ. And instead of applying a sine wave, now we actually use the envelopes of the speech signal. You see the sound pressure here. And we extracted the speech envelope and applied that electrically to the scalp, such that that would then uh, again be an electric signal in the auditory cortex, which would hopefully entrain the brain activity. The sentences were all of the very same type, a bit boring, you might say. Britta hat acht weiße Bilder. Britta has eight white pictures. You see the sound pressure at the top. And then, of course, if we present the auditory signal to the ear, and we want to present an electric signal to the brain, we need some latency in between because the auditory signal needs some time to travel uh, to the auditory cortex. And we, wouldn't not, we didn't know beforehand whether this would be 100 milliseconds like the M100, or would it be 50 milliseconds like the P50, or would it be some other latency? And therefore, we decided to try out a couple of latencies um, from 0 to 250 milliseconds and to see whether any of them would actually interfere with the intelligibility of these sentences that were presented in noise at different signal-to-noise ratios, uh, always in such a way that some of them were unintelligible. And the subject who sat in a cabin had to um, say the sentences into a microphone, and then afterwards we evaluated how many words were um, correctly perceived. And as sham conditions, we had one or as control conditions, we had a sham condition where we didn't apply um, speech envelope TACS, and we had two DC conditions where we applied um, anodal or cathodal TDCS to the cortex. And of course, our expectation was that this does not interfere with speech intelligibility, and at least one of them would do. Okay, now you're set for the results slide. So here we see the signal-to-noise ratio the, um, um, of the 50% threshold of the sigmoidal function for the three control conditions. And here we see the different latencies. And again, you see that both things happen. There are latencies at which it gets worse and at which you improve the intelligibility. Um, if you just compare that, then if we do, uh, did the same as what the reviewers requested for the previous study, if we compare that average across subjects, and therefore, since not everybody has the um, same best latency, if we look at the best latency in every subject and compare it to the worst latency in every subject, you see that that is highly significant. But we, again, looked for a sinusoidal modulation because you, you can think of maybe there is something in there, even though in average that does not need to be present, and therefore we did the following. We again ordered them according to where do they have their best latency, and then we uh, fitted sine waves, and here you see that done 
on average, and here you see that for all the single subjects. And yes, that works nicely. Everybody has a best latency where there is a significant modulation of the intelligibility and also other latencies uh, where it gets worse. All right, and now I do have some time to introduce to you some thoughts about our concepts um, because we were all talking about synchronization and resonance uh, and the like. And I have a dear colleague, Jürgen Kurz, who wrote this book. And I went to his place in Potsdam and I asked him, well, you're the master of synchronization. Please let me know how can I demonstrate that what we're seeing in the EEG is actually entrainment and not one of the other many phenomena. And the short answer is, show an oral tongue. The long answer is, read my book. So this book is really very interesting for everybody um, who speaks about entrainment, I think. And um, I'll give a brief summary of what I learned and what I think uh, is important. And I'll start with a system that does not oscillate at rest, but it can still show some phenomena. I have such a system here. This does not oscillate, you will all agree, right? But it will do two things. Can we switch the mic to the... Um, it will give you an impulse response. Right? But you can also make it resonate. Not oscillate, but resonate. And when you just observe what the system is doing, you just see an oscillation. And you don't know, are you looking, if, if you're only looking during the stimulation, it's very hard to tell apart um, a system that is resonating and a system that is oscillating. Uh, if you drive it at the right frequency, you get a very strong response. So the resonator does not oscillate at rest. It cannot show entrainment per definition. It, can, uh, it has a resonance frequency, so it can show resonance, and it can show impulse response. Um, and if you look at the frequency at which it oscillates, it will always oscillate at the driving frequency, at least after some... Um, I don't know how, the, how that intermediate region is called. And then what we're all after are oscillators. We do have brain oscillations. At least some people still believe that after Jonas' talk, I hope. Um, and the physical model would, for example, be a pendulum clock. These are the pendulum clocks of Christian Huygens, who first demonstrated that there is oscillation, uh, that there is entrainment. So we're looking for these Arnold tongues. And the differences are the oscillator does oscillate at rest. It has an eigenfrequency. And the interesting phenomenon is what I showed in the Arnold tongue. It can switch between these two regimes. It can either oscillate at its eigenfrequency, if you leave it alone or if you're too far away with your driving frequency from the eigenfrequency, or it can oscillate at the driving frequency if your driving fr uh, frequency is close enough to the eigenfrequency. So this system can show entrainment and co uh, can sh uh, show phase reset. And I don't know, this is not going to be complete, and you may not like all of these, but I think that um, the following stimulation methods can uh, lead or may, should be explained by the following mechanisms. Let's go through that one by one. If I use repetitive sensory stimulation, this can be auditory steady state, this can be visual flicker, whatever. If you do it at the eigenfrequency of an uh, oscillation, say the alpha oscillation, then you can, in principle, get entrainment. If you use repetitive uh, um, sensory stimulation at another frequency than the eigenfrequency, you will again get a steady state potential, but it cannot be explained by entrainment. That is most probably um, a superposition of impulse responses, as uh, Joachim Groß showed nicely in a recent paper. He's, I don't see him anymore. Then, if you use repetitive TMS at the eigenfrequency, this is just a huge impulse as compared to the size of the oscillation. This would not be considered entrainment by the authors of that book. As already Yuna said, only weak interference is considered. So that is probably a phase reset. But again, what you observe is a steady state potential. So that doesn't tell you anything. Then if you use RTMS at another frequency as the eigenfrequency, probably um, again, you get impulse responses, cannot be phase resets because there was no oscillations beforehand, and again, you would observe the same. Now, I wanted to classify TACS 
as compared to all of these others, because we know TACS is not able to uh, be super threshold and to make a silent neuron fire. But if you apply TACS at the eigenfrequency or close to the eigenfrequency of a brain oscillation, then we believe you can achieve entrainment. However, we and others have tried to apply TACS also at other frequencies, then um, uh, um, the frequency of an oscillator, and then you don't see anything, and well, that will tell you something, but that's also to be expected. And I'm looking forward to what you think of this um, attempt to get a classification scheme of what we're all doing. And my take-home message to you is that TACS can modulate parameters of brain oscillations. I showed you mainly the amplitude, but um, we're also trying to modulate the frequency and, of course, the phase of oscillations or the phase relation of multiple oscillators. And in turn, this modulation of um, an oscillator um, leads to modulations of cognitive processes and demonstrates the causal role. And most interestingly uh, for you probably is that if we use speech envelopes to um, and train the brain, that modulates speech intelligibility. And I'll be happy if more of you try this approach. I'll be happy to help. During the conference, I learned that already um, four other groups are trying to use very similar approaches, and I'm very happy about that. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and my group for doing the nice work. So thanks, Christoph, for the nice talk. I'm going to make the same remark that I, I did to you in private yesterday, just for everyone else. So uh, we are trying tax uh, with a, a low gamma oscillation at 30 hertz, uh, with the idea that we could boost the, 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 some sort of phonological uh, chunking. Uh, and we measure auditory steady state responses before the simulation and after the simulation, and, and also behavior. So we had a very strong hypothesis about what, what, what it should boost and, and that it should have an impact on phonological performance. We do have uh, an improvement in performance, but we don't see anything in the ASSR responses. <laughs> so there might be explanations, but uh, I mean, I think we have to be really careful what we really do uh, with the tax, because obviously we do something, but we don't know what. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks for the question, because um, I have a nice answer to that. We tried the same thing. We uh, seem to think along the same lines. Um, we also uh, recorded the ASSRs across many different frequencies and looked for the ASSR peak, which is typically around 40 hertz. And then we stimulated the subjects with TACS slightly below their ASSR peak and slightly above the ASSR peak, but not like 10 hertz away, but only, I don't remember exactly, 2 or 4 hertz away. And the interesting thing is that speeding up the ASSR was possible, but slowing down the ASSR peak was not possible. And we saw also um, a change in behavior because we uh, were able to show that the frequency of the ASSR correlated um, with the uh, gap threshold detection. So if you have a fast ASSR, you seem to be able to uh, localize short gaps in sounds. And that was even improved if we speeded up the ASSR. That was the behavioral effect. But our behavioral effect, where does it come from? But don't you think you can have a behavioral effect and not see an ASSR? The ASSR in our case, um, the behavior was recorded while we stimulated with TACS, and we looked at the ASSR afterwards. Um, and we don't know how long that remains, and therefore we only checked a couple of points of the ASSR and not all of the frequencies. Yeah, fair enough. That may be the explanation, but... Benedict, yeah. Is it on? Yeah. Okay, so Christoph, in the first half of your talk, you showed that you can use TACS to modulate hearing threshold, which is very nice. Uh, but how can you rule out that you're not doing exactly the same thing in the speech study? So you modulate hearing thresholds, and that has consequences for all kinds of auditory processing, but is not specific for, for speech. Um, okay, I w this wouldn't actually bother me. Um, so you would say the reason why they understand the speech better is not related to a higher order language area, but it's um, related to better perception uh, of the sounds in 
primary auditory cortices. Yeah. That, that may be a, an explanation of why we see the effect. For me, that would be completely fine. Okay. Ole? You were. Oh, sorry, Jonas. It's, it's, you, you should bring a beard. <laughs> I bring a beard next time, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Christoph, um, this is really, was really great, and thanks for this uh, sort of taxonomy in the end that you gave us, I mean, with the impulse response versus um, with the entrainment. What I'm trying to bring together is basically um, what you showed us and what uh, Christoph Kaiser just showed earlier. So, you, if, so, basically, I'm asking what is happening, what is missing here is what, when you stick in this complex envelope of a speech waveform in your TACS, when you... Uh, we call this still, how do you call this, envelope TACS, basically. Yeah. When you do this, like what is happening? Like what's happening physiologically probably hinges now on whether I have a, if I have a delta band oscillator, let's assume for now there is one at three hertz in A1 or something. Let's right. assume, or one point something hertz. I don't know, but there is a delta oscillator. So, and this gets now hit with this envelope. Is this a phenomenon where this goes, is this a resonance phenomenon then that, that this oscillation gets modulated by it, or maybe it's also interesting to hear what somebody like Christoph would say, because Christoph was a bit more careful whether there's an oscillation or whether it's just slowly drifting, fluctuating activity. But so are you assuming that your TACS envelope is somehow then affecting also baseline um, excitability of this piece of cortex, depending on the ongoing oscillation, or I'm sorry, I just, now it gets, but I, I, I already got uh, your question. So um, we're not using a sine wave, and therefore, strictly speaking, uh, at least in, in the book uh, about entrainment, this case is not considered. Um, and therefore, maybe one would not call this entrainment. But actually, one of the uh, former students of uh, Jürgen Kurz, Jan Freund, who is also now in Oldenburg, uh, wrote his habilitation about um, I don't know whether he called it quasi-periodic or stochastic um, resonance or um, entrainment or synchronization. I think he called it uh, synchronization. But they were able to show that if you have an oscillator that has an eigenfrequency, say, around 10 hertz, your um, stimulation doesn't have to be exactly a 10 hertz repetition rate, but it can vary. So uh, if the average frequency or the average interstimulus interval is... 10 hertz or 100 milliseconds, you can still um, entrain this oscillator. So maybe what we're seeing is um, entrainment, but I'm happy to hear what Christoph is saying. Actually, I'm, I'm a bit worried with the long latencies that you used. Um, I don't know why you used 50 milliseconds and much longer, because in neural terms, that's enough to go from auditory cortex to prefrontal cortex and back and forth and back and forth. Okay. Um, and at least if you believe this happens in early auditory areas, you should probably more use 10 millisecond intervals. And I think one of the biggest differences you had was actually between zero and 50 milliseconds in, okay. the, in speech entrainment. So if, if you believe you're tapping into this auditory cortical entrainment, I think you have to look at much uh, smaller delays between the text and the speech. We, we can try that. We were thinking um, the biggest response we see uh, in the scalp EEG to an auditory stimulus is, for example, the N100. And therefore, we figured we use latencies ra around 100 milliseconds. But we'll just try that. That's a good idea. This guy? Yeah, I, I have a question about this dissociation that you made between entrainment and resonance or oscillator and resonator. Um, so, of course, I understand the resonator is not spontaneously oscillating mm -hmm. uh, opposed to an oscillator. But is it really, I mean, you said it cannot entrain and it will not show an Arnold tone. And maybe I should have read the, the, the book by Pikowski, Rosenblum, and Kurtz more carefully or memorized it better. Uh, so I don't know what exactly they say about it. But, I mean, intuitively, I would think that a resonator should be also drivable by something that's not right at the uh, resonance frequency, right? Absolutely, like for example, when that, you did that your is true. experiment with the glass, I mean, you basically put in some kind of broadband excitation there, right? right. It's like sticking and shifting of your finger. And still it resonates at a particular frequency that is specific. No, it the... always oscillates at the driving frequency. There is an intermediate um, region where you see the, um, uh, 
resonance frequency and the driving frequency, but in the eingeschwungener Zustand, in the steady state, um, um, in the steady state of the system, when you drive it, it only shows the driving frequency. But that, but if you only look at the amplitude, if the driving frequency is close to the resonance frequency, then the amplitude is, of course, much higher than at other driving frequencies. I guess, I guess we agree on this. So I guess if your driving is a bit broad, it will resonate strongest in the at its at its at its own frequency, right? That's that's. I think there's no conflict there. But will it not also show something like an Arnold tone then? Like if you if you drive it very hard. It, it will, it will close to its resonance frequency, it will follow. If you drive it weaker, you have to be close to its resonance frequency to get the resonance. Right? Okay, I, I get your point, and that's really very tricky, uh, and that's why I said that's only the short answer. The long answer is read my book, because there are many further things um, uh, shown in the book. Um, what you have to show in the Arnold Tong is not the amplitude of the system, but you have to show a parameter that represents the phase locking between the signal and uh, the driver. And he said, the Arnold tongue is already pretty cool. Nobody has shown that for EEG, he said. But um, even what would be unequivocal proof, he said, <laughs> I'm just using his words now, is that if at the border of the Arnold tongue you find phase slips, then that is uh, proof that you are entraining a system that has an uh, eigenfrequency, because this can never happen uh, in a resonator system. The resonator will never jump back to its own frequency because it doesn't have an own frequency. And that is exactly what you see in the EEG. If you're at the border of the Arnold tongue, you see that it jumps back and forth between res uh, oscillating at, say, 10 hertz and oscillating at your driving frequency of 11 hertz, and then their phase jumps uh, if you look at the delta phase between the stimulator and the oscillator. Okay. <laughs> It's a very good question. I think it's one of the first sentences in the book about synchronization. They say, from only observing the measure, measure the, so the um, physiological observation, there is absolutely, or it's very hard to differentiate between uh, the, 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 the different cases. You have to make assumptions about the system so you know whether your system oscillates or not, and you can stimulate it at this uh, frequency or not. And then there... This can always happen, of course, yeah, but then, then you, there is entrainment, but you don't see it. But these phase slips um, are what you should be after. If you find that, that's, then you're sure you're entraining a system. This is sideways to your very nice talk, thank you. And that's getting at mechanisms underlying all of these stimulation techniques. Do we know anything about which class of cells might be more uh, affected by the stimulation? For example, you have multiple classes of inhibitory cells and classes of excitatory cells, and if different ones of them are affected, that gives you a better sense about what the stimulation is actually doing at the level of neuronal circuits. Uh, I understand that that's probably not where the field is now, but I'm asking you to comment on what the field knows about issues like that. This is a very nice question, but actually this is the type of question that we as experimenters ask you as um, simulators, uh -huh. and uh, Flavio Fröhlich has one person in the group who is uh, doing network simulations, and together with him, we're uh, uh, currently doing a network simulation where we 
simulate the stimulation of the network and where we can look at how the excitatory neurons and the fast spiking neurons respond to the stimulation. And we do that for many frequencies and many intensities and look for Arnold tongues. And th it's not final yet, but it looks like that the excitatory cells have their Arnold tongues at a different frequency than the inhibitory um, cells. And if you just compute the LFP, uh, across all of the cells, then you get a mixture of these overlapping RL tongues, and it's a very confusing picture. But if you, uh, instead of computing an LFP, um, just show the RL tongues of the membrane voltages of the single cells, then you can nicely separate what, how the excitatory cells and how the inhibitory cells react to the stimulation. And the main difference is it happens at different frequencies. I see. Well, if I may in in inject, you know, I thought Nancy, uh, when she raised her hand, would like to say that there are, you know, that resonators is a is a system in it, which is steady state response, in, you know, representation, and there are dynamic system representations of oscillators that might be better, you know, in terms of looking at this phenomenon of resonance, because they may behave differently closer or out of the, the, the you know, the tuned frequency. Right, that, that's why all of the physicists that uh, do that always look at systems for which they have a differential equation that they can use, and then they know what they're doing. But we don't have a differential equation for the brain. We can only stimulate it and observe some EEG parameters. So we, we have to go this uh, by way. Just let me answer. What you're doing sounds perfectly reasonable to me and very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I will now, this is another example of the useful interaction which we should have more of between physicists, modelers, physiologists to clarify the concepts we use. So thank you, Christoph, for raising all this. And thank you. <laughs>